Okay, we're ready to start. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the fifth uh, session of the special series uh, that we created on the impact of the war in Ukraine on the European Union. Uh, I introduced the series uh, um, for our first meeting and it is also introduced uh, online, so I'm not going to say too much about the series as a, as a whole, but I'm going to introduce today's sessions, which is on core state powers, on war, on European in integration, so very fundamental uh, aspects. It's a bit a special uh, session within the special series, because until now we had sessions devoted to fields of uh, integration, like energy, finance, uh, migration, we'll have, we'll have migration uh, next week, uh, uh, actually, uh, enlargement, defense, and today's session is a bit special because it's an overview. It's a more theoretical, broad uh, reflection on uh, the impact of this war on European, on European integration. And I'm very happy that this session is going to be introduced by Philip Genschel. Thank you very much. I, I, it's one of the, uh, I, I would like to say, the sharpest minds on these uh, questions about European uh, integ in integration. And uh, I very much look forward to uh, your input uh, presentation. We're in hybrid mode. Um, uh, we will, as every week, alternate questions and uh, comments because this should be a debate more than a Q&A um, uh, exercise. Um, we will alternate between uh, the online and the in-room uh, session. So uh, thank you very much, Philip. The floor is yours. Does this work now? Yes. OK. OK. Thank you, Daniele, for uh, the kind uh, introduction. Uh, thank you for uh, being here. Now, the war is uh, a good opportunity to review Bellis's series of state building and what they may or may not have to say um, on the effect of the war on the EU. Now, you know, Bellicist theories take for granted that war is invariably the basis of state formation, where state formation means basically the centralization of the core resources of the state, mostly coercive power and fiscal power and administrative control at the center and the parallel divestment of former power holders, magnets, cities, the nobility, uh, uh, communes of fiscal and coercive powers they may have held out of right uh, before. Now, why uh, do these balances theories assume that a war is associated with state building, with the centralization of core state powers, well, basically because they argue that uh, uh, wars trigger two conditions that are conducive to state building. And I labeled them for the, uh, uh, for the presentation, the post-functional condition and the functional condition. And my assistant to the right will tell me afterwards if these are fortunate labels. Uh, so what are these uh, conditions? post-functional condition. The idea here is that war, by triggering a collective sense of insecurity and by triggering collective imperatives to re-establish security, fuel community building and facilitate interest alignment. The war creates a community where no community existed before or it strengthens uh, existing uh, community and thereby creates a permissive consensus for seeding powers for the collective act effort. Uh, the functional condition is that uh, the central level of government, the state level, has a comparative advantage in exercising core state powers. So the central level is better at turning coercive power and, and uh, fiscal power into a military, economic, and social resilience. 
And this comparative advantage of the central level explains why in, in this particular situation, the war leads to a centralization of resources simply because it's better, the best way um, to fight the war. And the question is, do these conditions also hold for the EU? So does uh, the war in the Ukraine, that's what I will in the end um, uh, uh, probe, does it trigger the post-functional condition? Does it trigger the functional condition? So let's look at the uh, determinants of the post-functional condition first. So under what conditions are military threats likely to raise collective security imperatives, which, you know, fuel community building and a interest alignment. And I think three factors play a role. The first factor is the immediacy and urgency of the threat. The, because urgency threatens actors into a loss frame. You know, nothing focuses the mind like looking down the barrel of a gun. So if uh, all relevant actors in a, uh, are in a loss frame, you know, it's easier to um, uh, uh, get together uh, around loss avoidance. Uh, second, the symmetry of the threat. You know, does the uh, threat affect all parties to roughly the same extent, or are some much more vulnerable uh, than others. And of course, if a threat is more symmetric, uh, that tends to reinforce the feeling that we are all in the same boat, that we are all in the same position. Whereas, you know, if, if uh, the effect of the threat is really very different for different actors, they may, uh, that may undermine um, feelings of community, it may undermine a, a interest alignment, you know, intuitively, uh, Estonia is closer to Russia than Portugal. And the final factor is the nature of the threat. So is um, the military threat an exogenous, unprovoked uh, strike out of the blue, nobody's fault, or is it endogenous in the sense that certain members of the community may have provoked it through diplomatic uh, brinkmanship, uh, revisionism, etc. And obviously, you know, if there's an exogenous shock, if all members agree that the threat was really unprovoked, that uh, is likely to lead to a moral arousal that um, uh, supports and fuels um, uh, 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 trust, solidarity, and forbearance. So people are often prepared to help others uh, 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 cope with, with um, uh, uh, harm that they haven't um, caused themselves, even if they would never help others who have brought this harm upon themselves through their own mistakes. So the, the basic message here is that war can both unite and divide societies. Bellicist theories assume that the first effect predominates, but that may not always be uh, the case. What about the functional conditions? Under what conditions is it likely that the central level of government will have a comparative advantage in handling core state powers. Well, the first condition is very simple. Uh, Subcentral capacity is low or not scalable. You know, if there isn't anything to mobilize at the subcentral level, the demand for centralized uh, capacity that could help out is larger than if at the sub uh, central level you already have a high uh, 
uh, state capacity. So if sub-central levels are already pretty good at mobilizing coercive force, at enforcing taxation, or at issuing debt, uh, that tends to reduce um, the demand for central core state powers. The second um, uh, uh, determinant is perhaps a bit ironic. If the post-functional condition is weak, so if there's disagreement, if there is no alignment of interest, if there is little feeling of community, then the likelihood that centralized capacity will have functional advantages is higher because it's so difficult to get sub-central capacity coordinate. If, by contrast, you have a strong post-functional condition, strong feelings of community, strong solidarity, strong interest alignment, it's, uh, it's uh, easy to rely on sub-central capacity alone because um, uh, the post-functional condition will um, uh, provide a background coordination of sub-central action that makes centralization more or less uh, redundant. And the third condition that can create functional demand for central capacity is uh, if sub-central capacity exists but is uneven. So if some members of the community, for structural reason or temporarily, cannot do their part in collective action, um, uh, that creates weakest link problems. And there may be a demand for risk and burden sharing between um, sub-central capacity. This can uh, be organized uh, through the central level, but you know, I already mentioned here in brackets that the central level is uh, not the only and not always the most plausible level of risk and burden sharing. You know, if you want to share military risk in the EU, um, NATO is perhaps advantageous because it integrates the US in the risk pool. Uh, very simple. Point. So uh, the, the basic uh, uh, message here is that war can both strengthen central capacity, but it can also uh, strengthen sub-central levels of government. Um, you know, why do I look at the war in the Ukraine? Well, you know, I was asked that in, in Rome last year. What type of case is the, the Ukraine war? Is that most likely or is it crucial or what? Well, you know, the answer is it's one of the few cases. What other cases uh, would you uh, 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 look uh, at? And in, in this sense, I think it is crucial because it gives certain indications of what logic you may uh, uh, expect at work in the EU under balances conditions. Okay, so uh, basically uh, I check for indicators of the post-functional condition first. And you know, Dietland is in the room, she knows all this uh, by heart. And so to check for immediacy of the threat, I used a survey question from the YouGov UI survey where we basically asked what should, Europe's, what should the approach of EU member states towards Russia be? Should they invest more in defense or more in diplomacy? And what the graph shows you is responses for April 2021, that is before the war, and April 2022, that's uh, uh, after two months after the start of the war. 2022 is red, 2021. It's blue. And what you see is that on EU average, support for more diplomacy outweighed support uh, for more defense by roughly 20 percentage points in 2021. So the blue 
average is below the, the zero line. And this was completely reversed in uh, April uh, 2022. The red uh, line indicating the EU average is now at over 20%, meaning that support for more defense outweighs support for more diplomacy by, by 20 percentage points. So it's a change by 40 percentage points, which is, you know, quite massive. And as you can see, um, all member states in the survey participated in, the, in this trend. So in all member states, support for more defense went up considerably. But what you also see, of course, is very large differences in level of support and very much uh, very large differences in the size of the change, which indicates some underlying asymmetry. To further look into asymmetry, I, I used a, a very nice graph that Wheatland um, designed. And uh, it's based on a question where we simply ask respondents, what type of assistance to the Ukraine would you support? Should we provide humanitarian aid? Should we accept refugees? Should we send weapons? Uh, should we grant uh, fast EU membership? Um, should we accept higher energy prices in order to sanction Russia more? And the red dots give you the EU um, average. And you can see there are certain issues for which there is very high support, like sending humanitarian aid. And there are issues where there is very little support. So there's negative net support for accepting high energy prices as a cost uh, uh, of sanctions. So support varies across policy issues, but it also varies across countries where the spread is fairly low with humanitarian aid. So respondents in all surveyed countries basically said, yes, you know, humanitarian aid should be provided um, uh, to the Ukraine. The spread is very large for weapons deliveries and for energy prices and also for EU accession, suggesting, you know, great discrepancies between national positions uh, in all likelihood uh, reflecting underlying differences in actual or perceived uh, vulnerability. And basically, if, if you look at the timing and sequence of EU decisions from February to now, it basically follows uh, this graph. It started with the low hanging fruits in the upper left corner, and now we arrived in the lower right corner and the uh, going gets uh, much tougher. Finally, uh, you know, is uh, the uh, threat exogenous or is it endogenous? And we use this uh, question. It's not in the survey, it's not who is to blame for the war, but who is responsible for the situation in the Ukraine, not the best wording. But uh, here I take that to mean who is responsible for the war. And you can see uh, blue is uh, the answer. Uh, it's entirely or mostly Russia's fault. And that's clearly the majority, uh, absolute uh, or at least relative in all member states except Bulgaria. In Bulgaria, uh, uh, there's a majority of people who say that it's mostly or entirely uh, NATO's fault, so that's the, the red bar. But by and large, you know, there's a broad consensus that it's really uh, the EU's fault. And that explains why the many conflicts that there are in the EU um, uh, concerning sanctions concerning weapons are um, um, uh, negotiated with relative, in relatively civilized uh, terms. So uh, the willingness, for instance, to accommodate 
Hungary and Hungary's idiosyncratic demands has really scaled new heights. So there is a certain tendency to focus on problem solving and uh, avoid um, conflicts. And, you know, this constellation of immediacy, uh, asymmetry and exogeneity allowed for a fairly high willingness to cede core state powers to the, uh, uh, to the EU or to give away core state powers. I just have here data on support for creating a European army. And as you can see, it was very popular already <coughs> before the war. It's even more popular now. So um, average EU support, net support, so support minus opposition, is at almost 30%, which is fairly large. And in countries like uh, uh, Poland or, or Lita uh, Lithuania, it's, it's uh, extremely high. Okay, so, you know, uh, the, the, the short of it is, you know, there, there is a fairly strong post-functional condition in the early months of the war, but it's uneven. So the strength is fueled by the immediacy of the threat and the exogeneity uh, of the threat. But, you know, the unevenness uh, reflects the actual or perceived asymmetry of uh, the member states. Now, what about the functional condition? Well, you know, looking at it, it appears as if the comparative advantage of EU capacity is low. And why is that? Well, um, the first factor, even though on this slide it's the second factor, is that national capacity is significant and rapidly scalable. So all member, no member, almost no member state has problems with mobilizing coercive force, uh, force imposing taxes, issuing debt, uh, exerting uh, 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 administrative control. And this was um, scaled up immediately after the war. So after the war, 20 member states declared that they uh, will increase their defense budgets, some of them very substantively. Um, uh, all member states took national actions to decrease uh, energy independence from, to decrease energy dependence uh, on Russia. So they uh, built LNG terminals, um, doubled down on nuclear powers, accelerated the move to renewables, etc. And finally, all member states. Um, engaged in fiscal and expansion to pay for transfers to uh, energy dependent industries and uh, uh, consumers. And there are estimates that the fiscal expansion caused by the war is something between 1.5 and 2% of GDP. So national capacity exists and, you know, it can be built up. The second factor is that the post-functional condition is relatively strong, which makes uh, reliance on national power buildup, the national mobilizing, mobilization of force fairly compatible with you know, collective action at the EU level. You don't need a lot of coordination in order to make these national force builds up, for instance, in uh, defense to add up to something um, um, uh, uh, larger. Uh, so the risk of coordination failure was relatively low. And um, the final factor why EU capacity has a fairly low comparative advantage is uh, that there are non-EU solutions to weakest link problem. 
You know, in the military field, there's NATO, which clearly has economies of scale in uh, uh, military risk and burden sharing, economies of scale that are not available to the EU because the United States is not a member state. What the EU has, however, is economies of scope in sharing. So the EU can uh, share across policies, can, for instance, use funds from the common agricultural policy to suddenly finance the energy uh, transition. And this, of course, is something that NATO or other international organizations cannot provide. So what has uh, the EU done? Well, the first thing to observe is that the EU has not built up and doesn't intend to build up any supranational capacity for the direct exercise of coercive force or uh, 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 fiscal power. So the, the um, uh, uh, state staple items of a balance is state building, you know, the common army, common taxes, and uh, they are all uh, absent. So if you read the Versailles Declaration, of March 2022, that's the roadmap, the EU's roadmap, how to react to the war. The European army that's so popular with uh, European voters is not even mentioned. And um, I think it's very easy to see why that is. Even if you assume that there were efficiency advantages of centralizing military power, it will take time to realize these uh, advantages. So it's a major institutional reform to create, for instance, a European army. And <laughs> during a transition period, when national powers are no longer operational, but the European power is not yet operational, you know, performance may actually drop. And this is something that you don't want in a military emergency. You know, think back to, to Churchill's proposal of indissoluble union between Britain and France in 1940. And of course, the proposal immediately fell flat because it was completely unclear how it would uh, strengthen the country's combined uh, 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 ability to withstand German aggression, but it was very clear how it could create institutional chaos and conflict that nobody needed in this situation. And this is also something, of course, that applies uh, to the EU. What the EU did was not to build up own capacity, but to facilitate the national uh, built up of capacity by simply uh, self lim limiting its regulatory authority. So it suspended all kinds of regulatory constraints on the exercise of national court state powers. So the Stability and Growth Pact stays uh, suspended, state aid rules were suspended, climate goals went out of the window in order to allow for the burning of coal, um, you know, all kinds of environmental regulations were relaxed in order to uh, allow for the quick authorization of new, uh, new um, uh, renewable energies project. So in a way, you know, you know the uh, EU didn't build up capacity, but rather uh, build down its own regulatory uh, authority. And it's, it's interesting to um, uh, note the contrast to uh, a previous non-military crisis. So the refugee crisis, for instance, triggered the build up of EU capacity for the direct exercise of coercive power that was Frontex. And the Eurozone crisis did not uh, lead to a, a, an erosion of EU regulatory authority, but you know, to a strengthening through um, 
uh, you know, banking union and, and all these um, uh, fiscal policy packages, two pack, six pack, uh, uh, etc. Um, when, uh, when we look at weakest link problems, as I already said, in defense, there's complete uh, deference to NATO. You know, uh, the EU doesn't even claim to enter the military field. Uh, what it does it, is it repurposes existing EU funds to support national action. So the EU budget is used, the cohesion funds are used to pay for Ukrainian refugees. The European peace facility is used to pay for national weapons uh, deliveries to the Ukraine. Uh, the recovery and resilience facility is used to pay uh, for the energy uh, transition. So the uh, EU has used, and, and the Commission was very eager to use, uh, existing funds for new uh, purposes, and it was quite quick and, and successful at that. The problem now is that it has reached the limits. The, the uh, budgetary limits and there's now discussions about you know whether we should renegotiate uh, the uh, multi-annual financial framework in order to uh, increase the fiscal discretion of the eu whether there should be a new ngeu 2.0 to pay for the energy transition or for the Ukrainian uh, uh, reconstruction. But, you know, the reception in the member states has been remarkably cold to a large extent because, uh, you know, the resource crunch was not extreme. So in Bellis's series, they always assume, you know, wars are extremely extensive. And this creates a huge pressure on governance systems to mobilize mostly financial resource. But as of yet, and this can change, of course, the effect of the war has been much smaller than the COVID effect. So COVID has caused around about four percentage points of GDP in 2020. And as I said, as estimates are that um, uh, the reactions to the war, direct and indirect, um, uh, cause something between one and two percentage points of GDP in 2022. That's very significant, but also significantly smaller than uh, what we have seen in COVID. Finally, if we uh, turn to, you know, administrative capacity building for solving weakest link problems. The commission was very eager to, um, uh, 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 to reproduce its relative success in the joint procurement of vaccines, to transfer that to the joint procurement of gas or, or other energy sources. You know, after a lot of negotiations, they now have a, a voluntary platform for common purchases established, but interest is very low. And the basic um, uh, 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 feeling you get by reading uh, policy uh, declarations and statements is that the member states really don't feel that EU capacity building is an unburdening and a solution of weakest link problems, but it adds to these problems by making additional uh, demand. Um, so what do we see? No comparative advantage in the direct exercise and no comparative advantage in weakest link or, or sharing uh, problems. What can we learn? Well, the first thing I think we should learn is that war is not a necessary condition for either state formation or for EU 
uh, capacity. You know, non-military crisis had a larger effect on EU capa uh, ca uh, capacity building than the Ukraine war. And also, if you look historically, wars have both created states and destroyed states. Uh, think uh, of Poland in, in, in the 18th century. And a second war is not a sufficient condition for state formation. And this is because you need both conditions, the post-functional condition and the functional condition. So if there's a permissive environment for seeding core state powers, and if there's a strong functional rationality for centralizing core state powers, then state building or capacity building will happen. Balancist uh, theories assume that the two usually go together. And historically, that's not entirely wrong. So if you, if you look at um, um, large uh, macro data, you see that uh, a high incidence of war in the 19th century is associated with relative high state capacity today in the sample of I think 150 <coughs> states of Besley and, and Pearson have done that. But, uh, you know, in the EU, it seems that the functional and the post-functional condi uh, condition are rather inversely uh, related. So if you have the one, it's less likely that you also have uh, the other. So if the post-functional condition is strong, if you have strong collective interests, then the uh, coordination of national capacity is easy, and there is little comparative advantage in having unified EU capacity. If, by contrast, you know the post-functional uh, uh, condition is weak, you have weak collective interests weak solidarity, then there is a high risk of coordination failure and moral hazard and all that. And then you have a strong comparative advantage in centralizing EU capacity, but then you don't get it. So there's kind of a capacity uh, dilemma. So if you have a permissive consensus on central uh, state or EU capacity, then it, it is usually needed uh, least. And the final two lessons is, um, you know, the extent and scalability of some central or national capacity matters. In Bellis's series, it's usually assumed that uh, some uh, sub-central or non-state levels of governance have low or very constrained capacity in the EU, at least, um, uh, uh, most member states have fairly high uh, capacity. And the fi final observation when it comes to weak uh, weakest link problems and um, uh, uh, problems of reinsurance, uh, it is not obvious that the EU is always the optimal scale of risk sharing. The scale may be larger like NATO, but it can also be smaller. So right now in the energy field, you see a, a lot of minilateral cooperation in the EU. Also in the military field, you see these swaps, you know, uh, Slovakia sends uh, Russia, Soviet tanks to the Ukraine and is then reimbursed by Germany through new uh, Western tanks. That's not EU level, but that's not a uh, national uh, level either. And I think what matters here is, you know, this distinction between economies of scale in uh, uh, reinsurance and economies of scope in reinsurance. And the EU has economies of scope, but it may not always have the uh, ideal scale. Okay. On this happy note, I close and thank you for your attention. Okay, we thank you. <laughs>
So thank you, Philip. Um, this was uh, excellent and exactly what we need, I think. Let me just uh, um, put your uh, input in the frame of the seminar. So we have war, we have integration that you call state um, formation. Uh, and the question we ask in this seminar series is that what is the impact of the war on this uh, on, on integration? And um, your seminar is crucial because you discuss the conditions, the two conditions, uh, under which war is conducive to, uh, to more integration. Um, so it's conducive to having an impact, the conditions under which war has uh, an impact. And this is very useful for us because you then you you have a slide where you analyze this impact, you know, for example, on fiscal uh, or, or, or on the, the administrative uh, capacity, which uh, you took the, the example of uh, energy and defense, um, migration, and you took uh, Frontex as as, a, as an example. So you you conclude that okay. There isn't much uh, of, all, of all this. It's rather scaling uh, down, so build down own capacity to uh, enhance the member states' uh, capacity. So I don't want to discuss all this, but these are exactly the fields that we have analyzed uh, in our first section, uh, session on fiscal uh, integration. The conclusion was slightly different. You say, no, there is not much, but the conclusion was uh, something is happening. In the second session, we had energy. Yes, joint procurement, there is no much sympathy and support uh, for it, but something is happening uh, as well. Repower EU and, and, and so on. We had last week the session on uh, defense. Um, also very nuanced, what the, what the impact is there, but the, you say, okay, NATO, NATO takes uh, care of all this. Uh, the EU doesn't need to, can just, uh, dele dele delegate. Next, we will have migration, and we'll, we'll hear. But you already anticipated to some extent, and then there is there is enlargement. So, I open the floor now for the discussion and the and the, and the questions. Um, but I would like, or I would like to invite everyone to keep this general framework of the seminar series uh, uh, in mind. So, the floor is now open for questions. So I, I will. Do like this one, two, three, four, and you keep an eye on uh, the online and I turn around to see if there is. Okay, so Adrienne goes first. Yeah. I hope that mic works, otherwise. I don't know. Can you hear me? Does it work? Uh, thank you very much for focusing on a theory guided analysis of indeed, indeed these different integration dimensions and what favors them and which what would hinder them right or not make them necessary which you made very plausible but in a way you left uh, there is an elephant in the room which you didn't mention at all and that's the change to your political situation and the expectation of enlargement and soon and i think that means that we are standing right now at a real bifurcation at the European Union. Do we want to go for geopolitical reasons to an extensive enlargement of Ukraine, of course, Balkan states, of course, Georgia, uh, Moldavia, etc., etc., and it would make sense for geopolitical reasons? Or do we want to go down the road which you have been talking about, the more modest integration path? Can I suggest that we collect a couple? Um, uh, Gary is next. Is it uh, Gary or Philip Genschel, a doppelganger? Because I've got my sign right here for Philip. Um, this was a, this was a, a typical Genschel talk. You know, very very informative and and, and logically uh, coherent. Um, and you've got two. It's really two talks. You've got one talk on. The, uh, the Ukraine war and another to the more theoretical. I've got, I'm just going to make a comment right now on the theoretical. Um, and I think it, and it actually concerns the functional side of your, of your arguments. 
Um, when I think about the, you know, what is the the Riker argument? What are the what are the advantages of, of authoritative coordination with respect to war? Um, it is to avoid the problem of of, of moral hazard. I mean, just think about the way in which um, Hungary is exploiting its um, its the, the the decision rule of unanimity, or think about the way that um, Turkey is exploiting the decision rule of of unanimity, or from a bigger look. This is just the tip of the iceberg because we're not even in, in in engaged in war directly. But think about World War Two. Think about the way in which the Western powers exploited. The, the Eastern Front and the unwillingness to, you know, to, to open up a third front in, in, in or second front in, or really third front in France. I mean, the, the moral hazard issues of, of war are absolutely enormous. And when you have authoritative coordination, where you have some kind of, even if it's some super majoritarianism. And so I think this is, you know, I think that is fundamental. I don't think it, I don't think it fundamentally changes your argument, but I think it does put on the table some, you know, the, one of the basic reasons why states are useful. And I kind of, I, you sent me your paper earlier, and, and it was very interesting. And I can see how you've, you're still moving and still developing the argument. Um, but the words moral hazard or prisoner's dilemma weren't there. And I think that's, um, that's in there. And, and then just to add just a final, very short point, um, think about military procurement. I mean, in the absence of authoritative coordination, each country or each set of countries has its own military recipes. And you have to feel sorry for the Ukrainians who are trying to kind of use all of this equipment on different bases, some of it Soviet or post-Soviet, others German, American, all the rest of it. You know, the discombobulation in terms of military procurement is absolutely... Uh, um, disabling in terms of an effective response. Okay, uh, thank you for for this uh, question. So uh, let me start with Daniela. And of course, um, that something is happening is the feeling of many people and especially people in Brussels. And I, I think what they feel is that there's a higher baseline consensus than usual. And that allows for unity and speed and decision making that makes them a bit dizzy. And, and in this sense, something is indeed happening, but it's not a build up of EU capacity. So if, if you look at this repower EU thing, which is basically aspirational goal setting. They, they make recommendations for the member state by what state they should have achieved what reduction of, uh, of fossil fuel use or what target in um, renewable energy use. But in the end, it's down to national action. And if, I think it's very interesting to, to read this Versailles Declaration of mid-March 2022, where, where the uh, uh, European Council basically outlines what to do. And, you know, it's striking to see that the, they always say, we need to do more on defense. And that never means the EU has to do something. We need more to do more on energy, and that means the member states have to do more. So in, in, what they feel is suddenly it's possible to get the member states moving in, in, in parallel, in tandem, and, and that's uh, the change. I don't think that the EU is uh, changing a lot, which brings me to Adrienne's point, which is, of course, right. And I was thinking about having a conclusion with, which deals with enlargement, because especially the enlargement to, to um, in Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia would, of course, fundamentally change the situation in the EU. And in both respects, the post-functional 
and the functional. So if, if you think about the post-functional, you know, you, are, you have countries in the EU who were at war with Russia, which will increase the immediacy of the threat, but it can also increase uh, the likelihood uh, of a revisionist foreign policy. You, you know, suddenly you may have member states in the EU uh, who are dissatisfied with the territorial status quo. And that, of course, increases, you know, uh, the risk that you have endogenous threats. And at the same time, of course, it increases symmetry a lot, it increases weakest link problems a lot, and you could think how that might then fuel into, into more uh, uh, capacity. So I think you are absolutely right that this, it, this rather than you know, a deepening of integration directly, it, it could be the uh, major effect uh, of the war. On uh, Gary, um, moral hazard, Yes, I think you're, you're absolutely right. A moral hazard should be in the paper. Um, but in a way, you know, the way I try to take care of moral hazard is through this post-functional condition. And the assumption is, if the post-functional condition is strong, you know, the trust is higher and fear of moral hazard is lower. And of course, if you introduce a symmetry, and if you introduce maybe an element of endogeneity, then of course that undermines trust and increases concerns for moral hazard. And that we have a moral hazard problem with Hungary, I think everybody would agree. But um, you know, right now the a, a, a approach seems to be we we have just one free rider and it's better to let it free ride than um, uh, to really escalate um, the conflict with uh, Hungary and thereby block everything else. On military procurement, uh, the standard argument of the Commission is of course always, oh, if we have a joint military procurement huge economies uh, of scale, huge production runs. And the assumption is, of course, that the agreement on what to procure will be on the lowest common denominator. But uh, experience with um, projects of joint European procurement show that agreement is, most, uh, uh, is often on the largest common multiple, you know, each member state having idiosyncratic demands on the weapon system and the weapon system gets ever more heavy and ever more expensive and it would be better to simply buy something off the shelf in the United States. Actually, an argument that's made in Germany right now. Okay, we we'll continue. Uh, Yusuf is next. Yeah, uh, it's not my field of expertise. I have not much to say about your analysis of the uh, what happened in the European Union. Uh, it looks quite convincing. I'm, I have more problem with the theory and the link uh, between the theory and, and, and the examples you took because uh, Billis's theory, I'm not, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a historian, so I, I work a bit differently, but I think it really depends very much on the type of war. If you look at what happened during, uh, not the 20th century, but the, the, not the 90s, as you refer to, but the 20s, if you look at both the First and the Second World War, there is no question at all that in both cases, in all belligerent countries, whatever the type of political regime they had, there was a huge increase in centralization, whether in type of fisk, uh, for the reason, but to face the war, which, as you said yourself, is extremely expensive, but also to organize, you know, uh, uh, armaments, uh, the lack of supply of raw materials, etc., etc. So that happens in times of total war. But uh, 
the type of war we have is, is completely different. I mean, the EU is not technically at war. So you would, you're bound to have different effects. I mean, you, you, have, you don't have no effects at all. But if the EU was in a total war against Russia, leaving aside the nuclear side, it, it would be completely different. Of course, here there is NATO, which comes into the equation. But to, to, to reduce from uh, the um, Belize's theory used to the fact that it, has, it, it doesn't apply to the EU, uh, I'm not 100% convinced, to be honest. I think you, you could be just as con convincing with, without theory or by adapting the theory to a type of war. I mean, the same if you have a war like in Afghanistan, you don't you not put in your territory, it's not, there is no general mobilization, there is no uh, total war. Anyway, that, uh, that's my historical uh, perspective, <laughs> uh, suggested this remarks. Thank you. We can take a couple of more points. You're the person then. Uh... I, I had a point really that builds on, on, on what you just said, which is that, uh, what do you mean by war? Are we talking about uh, a war in which the EU is engaged. If and clearly in this case, in the case of the Ukraine war, we're not talking about that. If we're talking about a war in which the EU is engaged, are we talking about a colonial war, um, a localized, low low scale conflict, or are we talking about a total war in which case the conditions apply differently? And in that respect, empirically, I I wonder whether um, using the public opinion data to gauge the extent to which um, the war is a military threat is, is methodologically difficult to, to assume because really who makes decisions about military procurement, about military deployment, it's not public opinion. Uh, it's clearly the military chiefs, to some extent I would suppose the civilian chiefs. But the question really is, what is the perception of the military threat from Russia um, for the military chiefs, given the way the Ukraine war is playing out, I would argue that actually the Ukraine war is showing that mili militarily Russia is not a threat to the European Union. Uh, and so if you look at it like that, it changes completely empirically, I'm not talking theoretically, empirically it changes completely the, uh, the effects that, that, that the war is having on, uh, um, on, on integration. Um, and, yeah, there were other points that, that Gary made them so. Yeah, thanks, Phyllis, for this very interesting uh, talk. I guess my point builds a bit off of my neighbor's point, but in a slightly different way. Because yeah. I would like to challenge you on your point that this is a crucial case. Um, because for it to be a crucial case, the war would have to jeopardize the core existence of the Union as such, and um, in my view, the core existence of the Union depends first and foremost on its ability to preserve national industries in a globalized world, at least since uh, the late 1980s. And in this sense, it doesn't really do that, um, especially so because, as you already outlined, we have NATO to take care of defense matters. Um, but another reason why I find this interesting is that if you go back in history, Actually, it is the main point where this economic function is jeopardized um, that we do see movements towards more integration, capacity building, and even right now, uh, when it comes to, uh, for instance, the motor industry, the semiconductor industry, we do see a buildup of capacity, which is very much based on uh, the perception of jeopardy due to geopolitics, um, etc. So, I don't think it might be right to, to classify it as a crucial case for this, for this reason. Would you like to respond? Okay. In a way, um, uh, all three uh, questions revolve around the question, the case of what is the Ukraine war? And, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult, of course, um, to make the claim that's a crucial case in the sense of Gary. Uh, and I wouldn't claim that. I, I think what I use the case for is to show uh, the indeterminacy 
and contingency of the effect of war on a state building. Uh, you know, I, I have laid it out theoretically that, you know, the effect on war, uh, of war on state building can be ambiguous, can lead to, to fundamental strengthening, but can also lead to an undermining of states. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Ukraine case is a way to exercise that theory uh, and to show that it can lead to useful insights. But I wouldn't say uh, that uh, the case of the Ukraine destroys anything or falsifies anything. I, I think the theory helps to elucidate the case. And, and the case in turn can be used to elucidate the theory. But um, it's, this is not theory testing. This is perhaps application um, of, um, of theory. Um, you know, when I turn to Yousef, of course, the type of war matters and the intensity of war matters. You know, if you fight uh, wars of choice out of area in Afghanistan or off the coast of Somalia, that is very unlikely to induce the feeling of immediate threat of, of loss in any way. And of course, World War II, with the massive invasion of almost all countries of Europe, except Switzerland, um, was of, of a completely different magnitude and triggered stronger reactions. But, you know, it's interesting observe, to observe that it led, as you say, to the strengthening of the nation states. So nation states um, uh, mobilized coercive and fiscal and administrative powers. What it did not lead to was a fusion of state. This, this uh, federation of Britain and, and France didn't happen simply because it didn't make sense. And um, therefore, I'm, I'm not so sure. I, I completely buy your point that, you know, if now uh, Russia invaded Poland, <laughs> you know, that would be of a different magnitude and would trigger a different and perhaps more serious reaction than the invasion of the Ukraine. I'm not so sure, however, whether the invasion of Poland would lead to a massive centralizing. I have to go and forth. I think the, the uh, uh, Belisys theories apply to single states, that's my view, rather than to uh, uh, EU. Or, or then, then you should look at allies, how it applies to how allies go. Anyway. Well, but do, you know, the, uh, the state emerges from, this, uh, from the war. So wars create states where there weren't any states before. So it's unclear from a balances, well, from a balances perspective, what will in the end turn out to be a state. Um, and uh, therefore there are people, you know, Kellerman and McNamara in a recent article, and they seem to imply that if only uh, the EU had a decent war, you know, it would have all the fiscal powers it would need to set a monetary union right. And frankly, I find that extremely hard um, to believe. Um, one remark on Christakis, yes, you know, direct EU engagement that would make a difference. I, I, that's, you know, a different types of war matter. I completely buy this point. I also buy the point, of course, that public opinion doesn't, um, doesn't control political decision-making. You know, if public opinion is not 
worked upon politically, if it's not mobilized, it, 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 it doesn't do much. It's, it's a constraint. <laughs> what I find striking in, in the data that you know, Dietland and others collected um, uh, in April is um, how, how well it reflects on the micro level what we seem to be uh, observing at the level of political um, decision making. But, you know, I, I, I don't reconstruct the causal chain between the individual voter and what he and she thinks and uh, political uh, decisions. Okay, Lisbeth, did you? Um, I wasn't sure. Let me just first say that I, I really, I really enjoyed this, and I particularly I think what's useful is, is the framing of the post-functional um, and functional pressures or counter-pressures and, and the various, and, and just the thinking through of that, of how that um, affects or um, so helps us understand the scope conditions in which you might see more integration or not in response to a particular challenge. Um, I have three three points. The first one I'll be very quick on because it's also on state building and war, which I'm not sure is the best frame for you. I think the frame post functional versus functional may just be more direct and it guides you to its different comparisons. But on the state building and war, um, my uh, my question there was when you say Ballas's theories, I just want to know which ones precisely you are referring to, because I think it's not the Tilly-esque type of argument that's relevant for you. It's more the Rikerian argument, which mm -hmm. Gary also referred to. The tilly is one about con coercion and conquest, and it's one that actually starts from having a state, admittedly usually a small state, some sort of putative center, that then seeks to expand its territory. And that then uh, generates uh, pressures for taxation extraction of in the center first and then later you know also obviously trying to extract taxation from from the a conquested periphery i don't think that's relevant for you um it's the rikarian one but the rikarian one which is based on voluntary collaborate cooperation in, in in the face in facing the threat the rikarian one i think um, is, is again, and, and Yusuf, I think, made it most um, strongly there. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a threat, it's an existential threat to the units themselves that are not yet coalesced in a state, that are sort of semi independent, minimally, and perhaps maximally independent, sovereign, right? And I'm not sure that is a, 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 a good enough. And it seems to me too distant from the from where the European Union and its member states are for you to be relevant. I think what your post-functional functional frame does, it actually guides you to compare what the reaction of the European Union to this serious crisis with, and you did it almost spontaneously with COVID, with the migration crisis, with other crises, to assess to what extent this, this may trigger further integration steps. So that's my first point. I love the war um, and, and, and you know, state building type of thing, but I'm not sure it's, it's the most fruitful one for me. The second, which I got, which, is, which I think is really, really interesting, it's you make, again, more implicit than explicit, a distinction between centralization and coordination. And you sort of almost dismiss coordination as an interesting enhanced coordination, I think is a serious step towards integration, right? I mean, integration doesn't mean unilateral centralization necessarily. That's a very zero sum uh, way of understanding. And I don't need to explain you, but that's how it sort of came over to me. So the enhanced coordination is a very serious step towards integration, but, and there I'm piggybacking on, on what Gary Monk said, it's a very vulnerable way uh, fragile right because it is it doesn't necessarily solve um, the risk of moral hazard uh, it doesn't un unless 
it leads to a change in decision rules away from consensus to some sort of majoritarian voting. That's where I would expect the next pressures to be, not necessarily the unilateral transfer of resources from the national states, state machinery, to some EU army-esque type of machinery, except in, in very small kind of marginal areas, perhaps. But, you know, in, in changing the rules of the game with respect to enhanced coordination, mind you, I don't say enhanced cooperation, because that's taken by the EU as well, it has particular meaning. And, and the third point, and, and that's very quick, um, I just wanted to say, too early to tell Philip where this is going to lead, lead with respect to integration. Or you, you tell a bit the glass half empty story, but you could also have told the glass half full story. Or I could say, maybe you've got to think of this as a stepwise process, right? I mean, seeing the very first step. Just step back into the Rikerian logic, which I actually told you that perhaps is not the most fruitful one, but let's go there for a sec. Right. Um, the the, the a reaction to the British threat was, um, you know, the creation of a confederation and federation, but it was by no means the, uh, the centralization of significant resources, durably at least, in, in, you know, at the federal level, otherwise we wouldn't have had a civil war that really was, for most of its, I mean, for much of the time, was not really a civil war, it was a war between two quite, uh, quite strong separate armies, and that could only happen because the state militias maintained very significant economy until deep into the 19th century. And I better stop there because I don't know the details. Des King is not here, you probably mm -hmm. could tell us. Yeah. But I really enjoyed your presentation. Thanks a lot, I really enjoyed it as well. Um, more of a genuine question than a, than a comment per se. Um, so if, if I look at it from kind of an historical institutionalist perspective, you would say, okay, also timing matters, and it's actually quite a, quite a I mean, context heavy, given that there was just a COVID-19 pandemic and there was a very strong response right before it. And I just wonder the extent to which, you know, at some point there is some kind of state building fatigue or state building resistance, kind of just having built in right after, you know, there was already kind of feeling among you know, many European member states' capitals that the EU was already kind of pushing on some, on some issues and maybe less willingness to continue pushing for some others. Uh, and then the extent to which you, con you consider that you know, it may still be driving the EU's response going forward. Over to you again. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, again, very good comments and question. So is state building the best frame? Well, you know, this is a paper for debate section on Kellerman and McNamara on how they called war and state building in the EU. So I think it's, it's, it's perhaps not the best frame, but it's the required frame for this um, uh, paper. Um, what what uh, see what type of balances theory? Of course, there are many out there, and you're right. Of course, my reference is Riker and Kellerman and McNamara. They don't cite Riker a single time, but basically they're rehearsing Riker and. Uh, you know, I use Riker for the reasons you mentioned, you know, in Riker you have central elites and you have sub-central elites and they only come together if there's really an existential threat to the sub-central uh, units, otherwise, uh, you know, otherwise the uh, sub-central elites never give away. Uh, these uh, powers. I, I don't basically disagree with um, your second point. I, I have to think about how to make it, how to make my point less stark. But the point in Kellerman and therefore also in my paper is really on capacity and less on, you know, regulation. And what I've find 
quite striking also in the COVID crisis already is the readiness of the EU to say, look, all these market rules, you know, they hinder you, ignore them. You know, I, I, I find that, I find that, in, well, ignore, that was a bit stark again, but, um, you know, do you, do you think the stability and growth pact comes back? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, no, but you know, it will get harder to go back to the status quo under by the year. And you know, your your third point basically comes down to look, the future is open. And uh, I couldn't agree more, uh, of course. And you don't really know uh, what follows of this. And it's interesting to observe. So Ziblatt has this very interesting book on, you know, uh, federalism in Germany and non-federalism in Italy. In both countries, you had uh, governments, central governments with strong federal ideology but only in Germany it worked because the sub-central states had all the state capacity uh, the central government needed in order to mobilize power, etc. Um, but, you know, over the 50 years between 1870 and 1918, the system, of course, uh, developed deficiency. And one deficiency was, of course, that the center didn't have enough capacity, fiscal capacity, the only capacity it had, as the EU also increasingly develops, is to issue debt, which left you with a center that was completely over indebted, because all the tax, almost all the tax was with the member center. And then, you know, after the World War, uh, First World War, you had this massive centralization of fiscal capacity. And of course, I could see something like that also happen in the EU. You know, you have this um, NGEU. And right now, it's just about spending money. From now until 2027, everybody got to spend money, but at the uh, renegotiation of the multi-annual framework in 2027 or 28, I can't remember, they will have to decide how to fund the debt. You know, through national contributions, through European taxes, how they want to do that. And I think that then is the crunch point. And then you will see whether this was a Hamiltonian moment or not. So Chris Duckett says, a paper on the Hamiltonian moment, which is very helpful in this um, uh, respect. Uh, Robin, yes, I, I think it's, it, it's indeed true that you have to see this in historical sequence. And after one once in, in a century crisis, two years later, you have another once in a century crisis. And of course, you know, they're, 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 I'm not sure if it's a fatigue, but, you know, the problem for the Commission is, in a way, that NGEU raised too much money. So the member states can always say, ah, there are still 200 billion in loan left. No, use that before we do anything uh, else. Um, so it's not really, it, it really uh, blocks the commission from getting its hand on, on fresh resources. So the commission, of course, would like to have real sources of income. So this is why they auction off these um, emission certificates, even if, if it's completely counter their climate policy goals. But they, want to raise own revenue that they can then 
distribute as grants and not just loans. You know, the I, European Investment Bank also gives loans. Grants, that's the real thing. Um, I guess I have kind of a two finger was actually in relation to your, your last final point. But I do think, you know, there will be a crunch time. And that crunch time really does refer to the extension of super majoritarian rules in relation to um, defense and security. And if you go by, you know, if you want to extrapolate dangerous things to do, you'd say that there is, you know, that the, the extension of super majoritarianism has been a distinct feature of European integration. But I think you'd add a couple of things extra. One, the functional pressures um, are increasing. It relates to Adrienne's general point about geopolitics. That is to say, the geopolitical conflicts, and particularly including the United States and China, and thereby including Europe, are, in, are intensifying. Um, and then, second, totally um, um, kind of unknowable would be if there was a Trump regime in the United States. I mean, all bets would then go off the table because NATO would then become, in some sense, in, in, inoperable for the uncertainty and like that. So if you simply, I think if you want wants to extrapolate those functional pressures, I, I like the point, you know, you do one thing that Riker doesn't do, and that is he doesn't look inside those units. For Riker, the, the units are, um, are billiard balls. So, he, so what you what you're doing is you're saying, look, there has to be, you know, there has to be some consensus. There's there's divergence, and you're analysing that. That's what he doesn't do at all. Um, I think that's very important. But if you look at the functional side of this, you, I think you'd have to say that the functional pressures look like they are um, increasing. And if you look at the history of European integration, I think you'd say that super majoritarianism has been increasing too. So. I, I'm, I'm just wondering, and this really is speculative, I'm just wondering if the Ukraine war will be seen historically, we don't know that, but will be seen historically as the first kind of step in the context of intensifying geopolitical oppressions and a move, a further move in the direction of, you see, the, the decision making is so important for the, for the resources. How can you get resources under unanimity? If you have some kind of quasi-majoritarian, super-majoritarian um, decision making, then you're, you're in a different world. And so I'm, I'm my, I just, my, my feeling is that um, the European, that European integration is, is intensifying. And then I add Brexit to that, and that only reaffirms that expectation. I, I, I don't basically disagree that uh, you know European integration may be firming up uh, or something but it firms up in perhaps a different way than we assume a way that relies much more on member state power than on 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 centralized um, uh, institutions and uh, capacities about the super majoritarian rules yes it's it's obvious, of course, that this is the secular trend that you observe. But, you know, in, when it comes to resources, it's, of course, difficult to rely on, super, uh, on majoritarian rules of some kind because, you know, if the minority resists, the center has no enforcement power. So, you know, remember after the refugee crisis in 2016, when there was this majority decision on the distribution mechanism for refugees. And who was it? Poland and I think Slovakia and the third one, they said no. And they were outvoted. And they said, well, we are outvoted, but we are not going to comply. And then what are you going to do? It could, of course, be that these increasing functional pressures, which I also see China, Russia, the US, perhaps less reliable than it appears uh, right now, may, may facilitate uh, agreement and thereby make move to supermajoritarian decision-making 
easier, but you know, it cannot be relied upon. And in the absence of central capacity, I think central super majoritarian decision making is very fragile. You know, you talked about moral hazard and all that, and that comes in there. I, I, I just I just wanted to ask a question about NGU because you I agree with you that the crunch time will be uh, 2026 when they have to. They, by the way, they they said that um, the increase in own resources will not come from increased contributions from the member states, and so they, of course, that that's just a. I mean, they can go back on that. So, but presumably, it's going to be new European tax. But you said it's going to be the crunch time in terms of capacity. And I'm a bit struck by that because on the one hand, I agree that, you know, raising revenue is the fundamental fiscal power, but isn't borrowing also capacity building? And in that respect, um, when it was necessary to borrow, um, there was no necessity to build up the institutional capacity of the center to borrow. It's just, I mean, the commission is acting like a treasury and it's, it has the capacity to do that. Um, and I would say that militarily the same applies because there's also already a, a European a military headquarters, there's a, a military staff, the structures are there, but politically the same impediment in terms of the centralization of authority is lacking. But really my question is about how do you see borrowing in terms of capacity? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a very good question actually because i don't have a good answer um, you know as we all know building up a tax system is extremely difficult and takes time and you need an administrative infrastructure etc but eventually it will increase your power to issue debt now Issuing debt is, of course, power. As you can see, uh, the most indebted countries in the world are the richest states, not the poorest states. The poorest states cannot afford debt. Uh, the rich states can. So debt really is a power, but, but um, it's, of course, how shall I say, it's very fragile because at one point you have to pay back somebody has to pay back and if you have central debt without the central tax system then the question is always who will pay this back and that can easily rip apart a uh, 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 political unit and of course also in in history a lot of war finance was by debt you know what the rulers did in the end was usually they forced their creditors coercively to accept non-repayment so there was coercive capacity to back up um, uh, 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 the power to issue debt uh, in modern days you usually expect that debt up, is backed up by tax revenue rather than by uh, coercion, but it has to be backed up by something. And th therefore, you know, and of course in history, I, I talked about Germany between 1870 and 1918. You could also talk about the United States between the Civil War and, and, and the First World War, where, where the center was very debt dependent and everybody had the feeling, you know, this was this was very thin power because it it lacked uh, the backup. But you know, debt, of course, is is, is instantaneous power. You, you know, you don't need a lot of officials to issue European debt in, in large quantities, and NGEU was very successful in that. So the risk premium uh, on European debt uh, at certain points were lower than for Germany. 
which is, you know, quite an achievement. We have time for one last point. I just want to respond to an earlier comment about uh, how public opinion might not matter, which um, I think is not true, because uh, I, I think right now we see the influence of public opinion on pressures on governments, how far they go, for example, with the energy uh, the, uh, independence and uh, how far they want to go in having higher prices for potential independence and so on. So I think this will come together with being fatigued by the war over time, will come in as a post-functional pressure uh, that we also need to put in the equation as the war drags on, and it will influence uh, decisions regarding the energy sector, potentially also for military cooperation and integration. So I know it's an obvious point, but I thought I, I should make it <laughs> um, because um, how important it is to, to look at that as well. One last word. Well, well, I completely agree. And you know, you you could have war fatigue as as well. You know, if there's a feeling ah, it's not so serious for Europe after all. Then all these symmetries come up again, and uh, you know, moral hazard and all that. And then you will have post-functional constraints rather than post-functional enablement. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone, but especially to Philip for really uh, excellent thought-provoking and uh, very useful um, framework, I think, for our entire uh, series of, of seminars. We continue next week. We'll have the session that addresses the impact of the war on migration. Um, and it will be introduced by Jelena Dank Dancic and uh, Martin Roos. Um, so we continue this conversation uh, uh, focusing on a specific uh, field. It will be our second last session. The last one is on enlargement. Um, so I hope to see many of you again in a week time. Uh, thank you very much again. Have a good rest of the week.